So this time I will show you how to do a quick refinement of the alignment of two images. Could be more than two, right? Uh, of n images. In this case, just two to keep it simple. And that's the same data set we looked at last time. And I opened it here already. As you can see, if I press C, you see nicely the overlay of the two images. This is what we did manually last round, so that's more or less right. But of course, it could be a bit off. So actually, to show you the effect of this um, registration, I will actually manually make it a bit worse, the alignment. So I again do a manual transform, move it a bit over, and bake that. So now we do registration. So the idea is to detect interest points first. That means you have to find little blobby things in the image that will be used for registration. So you can give them a label, you can call them things, or you can do whatever. So this label is just there in case you have multiple interest points that you can handle them. You can also really do a lot of processing on these interest points. You can thin them out, you can remove parts of them, and so on and so on. But I will, we will go into this another time. So in this case, we need a very simple uh, finding of interest points followed by registration. So um, I usually do interactive first, just to really get a feedback of what we're actually looking at. So, as you can see here, the pre-computed resolution levels that we have are 101, 202. It's not really important, but this just means that those will be loaded very quickly. So, in this case, I will do downsample because usually full resolution does not make sense. Usually, at least two times downsample is a good, or even four, eight, depending on the images, is a good um, level to find interest points. But this depends on the sample. So, here we use this. You can use the same in at max intensity for both views. I will not do this because they seem to be a little different, so it's going to compute this uh, for each of the images individually. The reason for that is that we just compute one single threshold, and this single threshold works for all images that we run it on in this case. You could also run it individually, but that's a lot of effort. So that's why, uh, you know, if you use this threshold is relative to the min and max intensity of each image. Okay, so we run this and do the interactive. And it asks you on which of the two you want to do the interactive, so we just choose the first one, doesn't really matter in this case. And it shows you these pre-computed uh, these images that it just opens. This is just the area in which it shows you the preview. It doesn't mean anything for the processing. So in this case, we kind of want to find these blobby things here for sure, and maybe some others. So we zoom in a little bit. Yeah, the standard thing actually looks pretty reasonable. You go up a little bit of the... Oh, not. So as you can see, right, the threshold really changes how many you find. So we do something like this. Sigma changes the size of the objects to be found. The bigger, the more stable usually, but also the bigger, the less you find. So there's usually a trade-off. Okay, so that seems like a reasonable setting. And I will just apply this. It finds this very quickly within a few seconds. And we can actually now look at this using the interest point explorer here which then will, if you click on this, will show you which interest points it found. And two, that looks kind of reasonable. We really just see after registration if this was really what we wanted. Okay, I did. turn this off again. And now do the registration. And there's a lot of parameters here. So uh, there is a rotation invariant matching, which means the images can be rotated relative to each other however they want. But it only works well if the interest points are really randomly distributed, like with beads or so. So here, I'm not sure if this would work. That's why, and we also have it manually already, almost in the right orientation. So that's why you want to use the translation invariant. That means it doesn't care how, how they're translated relative to each other. It's invariant to that. But the rotation has to be more or less right. I mean, plus minus five degrees is maybe okay, but it has to be more or less right. So this is what we're going to use, the precise one. Fast, you only want to use if you have like above 10,000 uh, uh, interest points. So that asks you which one. Okay, we only have one, and we do, and we only want to compare the views that are already overlapping right now. For the two, it doesn't really matter. This makes more sense if you have like 50 uh, images arranged in a, in a tile configuration or so. Okay, so now it asks you a lot of things. Practically, you can keep just the first view fixed. You can select which ones you don't want to move. You cannot fix some of them, but this becomes uh, more advanced. Usually, it's fine to fix the first view of the map back. We will go into another time. Transformation model, that's an important question. So usually, it asks you. This means it can only move. This means it can move and translate and rotate. Sorry, 
move and rotate. And this means it can also scale and shear and do all these things. So in this case, I would say we need this because there is a little bit of a affine effect here, as I saw from before. Maybe rigid is fine. It really depends on kind of how you want to analyze it, if it's okay for you. Yeah, as, as it, this introduces non symmetric scaling. That means the different axes, x, y, z can be scaled in a different amount. So this could lead to little changes in distances and so on. If you don't want this, don't use it. However, usually these changes are like 1% and will also you will see later what these changes are. So usually affine is okay, especially if you then regularize the whole thing. You know, if you say, okay, we do affine, but only a bit of affine and we regularize it with a rigid. That means rotate and uh, scale a little bit. We tried with the standard parameters. Uh, I will not go into details now about this. Let's see if this works. I think it does not, but let's just give it a shot. Now it asks the regularization. We regularized the affine with the rigid model, and the rigid has 10%, so it's a fraction 0.1, so 10% rigid. That's fine. So, in the window you said it didn't find anything, so it is not good. However, it told you that it found 7 out of 12. So we have said that we need at least 12 to trust this whole registration. So now uh, we do this again and now we try to improve the parameters that actually finds enough points. So the number of neighbors is not something you usually want to change but you might want to change the redundancy. That means it just tries to find more corresponding points. So we set this to 2 and then what it always does it finds the best and the second best one. And the significance says how much better the best has to be than the second best. So if we take this down at the same time, that means we'll find more. So now we really increase the amount of uh, descriptors that can be found. We press OK. And now it runs. It takes a bit longer. So the complexity increases significantly. And as you saw, snap, it found the registration with an error of 1.6 pixels. And it found overall 15 matches, which is on the lower edge, but it's OK. And now we can even look which matches these are. So here now we have the corresponding points and you can see that they're all in this area here, especially if you set this to gray, it becomes more. Right, you can zoom in and you see that these are the points it found to be corresponding. And they're so close to each other because this is basically the corresponding one from the two of you, so you the one of them. Okay, so you could stop here and say, good, I'm happy with this uh, registration. What you might want to do though is refine this even more. So there's another registration scheme which um, registers, doesn't, it doesn't try to find corresponding points without having any a priori knowledge. The iterative closest point actually assumes whatever point from the other image is closest and assigns it as a correspondence. And this is an iterative process. This was originally developed for for matching different surface scans from laser scanners or something like this. So this works here pretty well actually. So now that we are very close to the result, we can actually do this. And it will find more correspondences. We use the same model, affine, regularization, five uh, pixels error, rigid uh, regularization, run this, and zack, it changed actually quite a bit. And it found Here, 46 with an average error of 1.6 uh, pixels. So if you look at the correspondences now, it's way more nicely distributed. Now there's some down here, that's why it actually rotated this a little bit around. So that's actually a desired outcome. So let's see where this point actually sits. Uh, yeah, okay. So it found this point as well to be corresponding to this little block. Okay, so, so much for the alignment. Now you have a nicely aligned data set. And I stop here for now. We could now even go to non-rigid alignment, but again, that's gonna be in a different video as well. And of course, never forget to press save.